Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this very special webinar, which is organized exclusive for you, which is our Yes First and Yes First business customers. So I'll start with introducing myself uh, about this entire program, about what we bring on the table as far as various solutions are concerned, and uh, about a new concept called life settlement, and that's where we all have gathered. Uh, so so uh, this is how the entire uh, event flow is. So we'll start with myself. Uh, I am Rajiv Mathur. I am responsible for uh, business at Yes Securities. So basically, we are the 100% uh, subsidiary of Yes Bank, dealing in investment banking, merchant banking, institution equities, wealth, covering all the enterprise solution and wealth solution. And since, since you are one of the most esteemed client of uh, Yes Bank, I'm sure that this is, you are aware that this is a premium banking uh, solution which Yes Bank provides, which covers wealth management and business banking propositions. Basically, again, enterprise solution and wealth solutions specially curated for the creme de la creme clients like you. So uh, as you might be aware that uh, we keep on coming out with new uh, and unique uh, solutions which which we, we take help of our partners, uh, we do our arrangements with them, the industry stalwarts. And idea is to basically give you uh, an uh, overview of what is happening uh, uh, in the globe, in the domestic circuits, because it's, as you all are aware, that these are extremely, extremely challenging times. A lot of turbulence in terms of equities, a lot of turbulence in terms of commodities. And also uh, domestically, a lot of current, uh, turbulence as far as currencies are also concerned. So, so it's, it's a difficult and a different situation. And I'm sure uh, you all are, uh, you must want to know that what is happening around and what are the alternates in terms of the uh, investment solution these days. So without wasting much of the time, I'll not steal the thunder. thunder. So let me just first welcome and introduce you to Patricia from Black Oak Investor Relations. So this Hi. webinar is all about uh, the, the new concept on, in the block, which is basically life settlement funds. These are some of the solutions which are, you can say, agnostic to equity markets, Nifty, uh, Sensex, can go anywhere. It is agnostic to your commodity movement also. So this is a new and uh, relatively new uh, solution as far as Indian domestic ecosystem is concerned. So just to make us aware about this entire concept, which is life settlement, we have Patricia. Uh, so she's responsible basically for spearheading Black Oak reach across globe. Uh, she's a vast experience of almost a decade uh, in advising institution as well as large private investors on specifically on portfolio allocation and investment ideas covering all range of asset classes. So she was responsible across Europe at Credit Suisse Zurich in Z Julius Beer and EFG Bank Hong Kong. Again, advising uh, on various asset classes, managing multi-billion dollars. So she holds a MA in uh, of Slavic uh, Philology and Political Science and Modern and Contemporary History from the Unis University of uh, Munich as well as a MSc in business and management from uh, uh, Stratai Business School. Just one request, sir, and uh, ma'am, that all the, I'm sure since this is a new concept, there'll be a lot of question and answers and queries around what is this concept all about. Uh, if, if you notice, there is a Q&A box uh, at, at, the, uh, at the bottom of this slide. Uh, whatever queries you have, just keep on posting it on the Q&A group. The flow is that once Patricia finishes, we'll take all your queries one on one. So this is the entire event flow. This is how we have curated this event for you. So without wasting much of the time, over to Patricia. Thank you very much for, for the great introduction. First of all, welcome everyone to the seminar. I'm uh, quickly sharing the presentation. Uh, basically, in order to give you a little bit of background on, on the agenda, how I would like today to start off is uh, basically to give you a little bit of um, a summary, a recap of the current uh, market situation. 
and then also relating it to how has it affected life settlements as an asset class. And once we've done the comparison, I will go into more specific um, you know, concepts like what exactly is a life settlement, and how long has this asset class been around, and so on and so forth. So obviously, I, I don't need to... Um, you know, um, assume or I, I would heavily assume that everyone is uh, very aware what is happening with currently on the markets. Uh, we have seen a lot of volatility, whether it is like a fixed income, whether it is in equities. So actually, uh, just to start off with, when you look at the life settlements as an asset class, the closest you uh, can compare it to another asset class is certainly fixed income. So now, what are the outstanding remarks that I would like to emphasize on, on this particular slide? So the green one is Black Oak Life Settlement Fund. And the other colors you may see on the right hand side are the indices of S&P, of um, you know, any other um, type of bond indexes and so on and so forth. So now when we look at the overall picture, what has happened in particular this year, we have seen a lot of you know, traditional asset classes being very volatile, actually losing capital for investors. Um, and at the same time, looking at life settlements, as Rajiv has rightly pointed out, they're actually not correlated to the um, traditional markets, basically. So uh, when you, of course, it's very simple to just look at the performance and point out, okay, Black Oak has uh, performed um, actually this year, year to date as of August. It has uh, returned 6.7%. Uh, and if you compare it to most of the other asset classes, uh, you know, this is certainly like an outstanding performance. But where I feel this is equally important to, to be addressed is, first of all, when we look at the volatility of other asset classes. So, for example, fixed income this year has actually been quite volatile. I mean, um, even more volatile than usually. But when you look at Black Oak's performance, uh, you can see that actually 96% of the months were positive in the last eight and a half years since inception. And if you compare it to most of the other indices, like the bond index, S&P index, any other uh, fixed income directional index, um, they usually have probably a range between 50 and 85% of positive performance um, in their track record. So at the end of the day, what is even more important when we look at, okay, like even if there's drawdowns, so when we look at the historical drawdowns of uh, life settlement funds such as Black Oak, we have seen the highest drawdown, uh, which was minus 2.4%, and actually that was the last time in December 2016. So this is uh, very um, apparent when you look at this chart that if you compare it to any other of those indices, they may have dropped between 6 to 20% throughout their lifespan. And this is also another kind of key differentiator. So first of all, um, volatility much lower than uh, more traditional fixed income um, investments in terms of uh, price or NAV. But at the same time, when you just look at the maximal drawdown from a historical perspective, it is uh, much lower than most of the other indices. And lastly, of course, looking at the correlation, which we have already mentioned, Rajiv and myself, um, Black Oak has no or very little correlation to those type of fixed income indices. And this is basically the, the bottom line of this particular slide. So again, just to recap, um, these are certainly low correlation, low volatility, and you know, lower downside potential compared to fixed income indices. Now, um, just a brief comparison with equities, uh, because the main difference here is mostly that equities tend to be a bit more uh, volatile. So the main uh, difference is apart from, of course, the performance, which you can see yourself, um, Black Oak again is uh, the green slide, um, is, is a differentiator. But certainly when it comes to, you know, the positive months over, you know, the last eight and a half years, Black Oak has had 96% of the months positive, whereas the other indices like MSCI World, S&P, MSCI Asia Pacific, they range between, let's say, 50% and 67%. Uh, Same applies to the volatility, so actually 
how much, like, uh, what, what were the largest drawdowns or losses recorded on a month-to-month -month basis. So here, again, Black Oak very exceptional in terms of 2.4% and um, minus, between minus uh, 15 to minus uh, 25% for, for the other more traditional equity indices. And lastly, of course, looking at the correlation, um, again, we can kind of reconfirm just looking at the numbers that the performance of the fund is not correlated to the performance of equity um, indices, basically. That is the baseline. So this just gives you like a general comparison of live settlement as an asset class compared to um, more traditional asset classes. So now what you probably would be very curious about is, okay, so what exactly are life settlements? How are returns generated? And this is where I would like to take a step back first, because there is a little bit of a bigger picture that everyone has to, to understand who has joined this call. So when we look at the U.S. Uh, population, obviously it's a developed um, economy. It's a very like, um, it's an aging population. And there is uh, a lot of seniors. At the same time, um, the, the U.S. has a very profound um, life insurance culture. So that basically means that quite a lot of individuals, they take one, two or three life insurance policies. So now usually they get those policies in their 30s or 40s. And let's say 20 to 30 years down the line, they realize, oh, well, um, I may not need several policies or actually this one single policy I have, I don't really need it anymore. At the same time, you know, the premiums can be very expensive. They can be 50 to 100,000 US dollars a year. So let's say for someone who is um, at a senior age and possibly already retired, it is a very huge kind of expense. So now just looking at life settlements in the US, uh, life insurance policies, they're considered as private property. So there is a Supreme Court ruling that classifies uh, life insurance policies as property, such as real estate, such as an investment portfolio, and so on and so forth. So now when those individuals decide, never mind, I don't need this policy anymore, what possibilities do they have to exit? So traditionally, they would be lapsing the policy, so simply not paying the premiums, and then the policy would lapse, but they will not get any financial reward or payback from the insurance company. Or possibly they can approach the insurance carrier and ask to surrender the policy. But now the thing is that these policies, they do not have any investment component or underlying. They're simple life coverages. So the insurance company would only pay once uh, someone deceases. So basically the insurance carrier will offer a very negligible amount. So let's assume we have a $1 million policy the insurance carrier will offer 10, 20,000 US dollars to that particular um, senior citizen. So out of this uh, larger context over the last, uh, I mean, officially 100 years, but let's say in a more institutional framework over the last 30 years, this particular asset class has evolved. So what does it mean? What is a life settlement? So basically we have this policy owner, a senior citizen, who is selling their policy to an institutional investor, such in our case, Black Oak Fund. Black Oak Fund estimates the life expectancy, estimates the price of uh, how much they would pay for this policy. So let's assume this 1 million US dollar policy, Black Oak says, okay, according to our actuarial analyses, so uh, according to those uh, actuarial analyses, they would have to, uh, for example, offer those or pay 400,000 US dollars in cash to that particular um, senior citizen who will then basically transfer the ownership of this particular policy to the fund. So this senior citizen instantly receives, let's say, 400,000 US dollars, whereas otherwise they would not receive anything or a very uh, minor sum from the insurance carrier. So now Black Oak has acquired this particular policy and will pay premiums for the next on average five to six years until the senior will pass and then we'll collect the um, payment from the insurance carrier. So this is just a very simple concept. So this is just showing 
um, what I explained when I started of what a live settlement is, how did these particular you know um, transactions come about, basically by senior citizens having the need of disposing uh, simply their, their life insurance policies. And now, just from a more uh, financial perspective, how are the returns actually generated? So what are the cash flows, basically? It is uh, fairly simple as a concept. So BlackRock initially pays the purchase price, for example, those 400,000 US dollars. Then for um, five, six, seven years, we'll pay the, the premiums. So we'll have also expenses. And after those five, six years, when uh, the, the individual deceases, the policy money will be paid by one of the largest US insurance companies and will be paid directly to the fund. So this is when the profits are realized on the policy because you have those expenses, but then you get like a, a payment of 1 million US dollars, for example. So now this is one of the key slides. So uh, I would really like to kind of uh, draw your attention to what are actually the main investment attractions of Black Oak Fund and as such life settlements as an asset class. So obviously we have already uh, re-emphasized several times it has a low market correlation because the performance is based on you know the performance of those policies and the actual payments coming into the fund and not any type of you know what is happening on the um, uh, equity markets fixed income markets it is not related to interest rates and so on and so forth also i mentioned that actually those payments are performed or those insurance the payments are coming from U.S. insurance companies. And we're talking, these are the largest U.S. insurance carriers. On average in the portfolio, they have an A-plus credit rating. So these are very financially sound um, insurance institutions in the U.S. that are backing those payments for those uh, insurance companies. Um, also, when we look at the performance, um, so I've already, you know, I haven't gone into very great detail in terms of numbers in the first few slides, comparing it to the other asset classes. However, like just looking at the numbers, Black Oak historically has um, returned 14.7% annually um, net of management fees since inception. So since uh, 2014. So now... Of course, uh, probably one of your questions will, okay, how sustainable are those returns? What are your projections? So I would say um, the range of performance for Black Oak in terms of going forward, looking at the dynamics on the live settlement market, we should be expecting between 12 to 14% net of management fee on an annual basis. So this is certainly you know, a very good returns with a very, um, you know, excellent risk adjusted, uh, like, um, you know, scenario, because at the same time, we're talking about an A plus rated portfolio and the largest insurance carriers, uh, you know, backing or guaranteeing those payments. More importantly, even so is when we look at the regulatory environment, to be very honest with you, the first time I heard about live settlements and the first time I came across, uh, you know, Black Oak Fund, I was quite like, okay, I, I understand this concept. This sounds very interesting, but is this actually legal? Or how does it look like from a regulatory perspective? What if the regulator decides, oh, we no longer, you know, tolerate those transactions? So we're in a very safe space uh, because, first of all, I mentioned the Supreme Court ruling over 100 years ago that life insurance policies are, um, you know, considered as private property. But also those transactions of buying and selling those life insurance policies, they're very well regulated in the U.S. So that basically means any stakeholder in this particular market has to be licensed, has to be authorized to actually participate in those type of transactions. And now what is actually looking just at the sheer volume. So there's 20 uh, trillion U.S. dollars of life insurance policies outstanding. That is a very vast number. So like just the Chinese equity market capitalization is 13 trillion. Of course, not every single policy will be eligible for life settlement portfolio. But let's say roughly 200 billion of policies can be settled into a portfolio a year. And there is a very active institutional market buying and selling those policies. And this is all regulated. 
So from an investor point of view, um, there is no, uh, you know, the, the risk is very low for actually having the regulator to come and step in and decide, oh, we no longer tolerate this. Because also from a state or government perspective, if seniors can monetize their policies, they will no, not need any support going forward from the government um, in terms of, uh, you know, medical care or, you, you know, later on, you, you know, certain benefits because they run out of savings. So as of today, actually 43 states in the U.S. have regulations. And these are actually the states that have the most uh, population and where those transactions are happening. Lastly, just a brief recap, social benefit to those seniors that are actually selling those policies because they receive cash straight away instead of basically lapsing the policy or having to surrender it for a very like minor uh, amount. So uh, this is actually something that I've touched upon in the previous slide, like certain numbers about the live settlement market. So again, it is a very large market. It is a very regulated market. There's a lot of institutional players. Now, first of all, when we look at there's a lot of institutional players, what are actually the typical investors in life settlement classes? First of all, um, typical investors are pension funds, endowments, any type of institutional investor that you can come across has some sort of allocation into life settlements as an asset class. However, when you look at the private space, it has been uh, the last 20 years probably uh, less accessible, simply for that reason that usually if a private client is interested in accessing a life settlement portfolio, they will need 30, 40, 50 million US dollars to allocate so that actually one of the manager would, managers would create a portfolio for them. So basically, just having access to Black Oak, which is an open-ended portfolio with a smaller investment amount, is actually giving a private client also exposure to a very institutional investment that is not easily accessible usually. And now just looking at the wider um, outlook for this life settlement market is, we obviously see the population is aging in the US. By 2030, there will be more seniors than juniors. So obviously, um, you, you know, there's more baby boomers retiring. So there's a lot of seniors and also currently, you know, high inflation means that they're spending their money faster, unfortunately. So much there's like basically a, a, an estimation that much more seniors will actually sell their policies going forward. So the outlook is that supply will increase for this particular market, which will help to, to sustain those returns also for Black Oak. So now, um, this is just a brief overview of all the states and the regulations. Let's not, you know, spend too much time because there's a lot of information that I have to, you know, convey today in our webinar. Uh, I would say uh, if someone has been distracted or, you know, I think this is probably the second slide where I would like to draw your attention to. So now when we compare black oak to fixed income from a slightly different perspective, okay, so when we look at the risk, when we look at the returns. So first of all, um, the average life settlement portfolio has a, uh, an annual return of 8 to 12%. Black oak has um, historically outperformed the life settlement market. I'll get into the details in, in a short uh, while. Um, so now, of course, some of the numbers actually are, uh, since the latest Fed hikes, maybe not um, updated. But basically, the key is if an investor wishes to invest into, let's say, a more traditional fixed income asset, the uh, returns are lower than what they can get on the market. So obviously, Treasury and U.S. corporate bonds have a low risk. Uh, fairly, like This is probably the risk you can compare uh, Black Oak to, to a certain uh, extent. But at the same time, the returns are much lower in comparison. Now, of course, an investor can decide to go into a high yield portfolio and maybe come closer to those, let's say, um, 10, 12 or 14 percent for Black Oak. But at the same time, the risk they're taking in terms of credit is much higher. So now maybe as a last um, you know, um, point of confidence in terms of credit counterparty risk, what I would like to emphasize is. So I mentioned that those large insurance carriers, they're backing those payments. So maybe some of you will ask, okay, look, 
we're currently in a very um, you know unpredictable situation. What happens is that actually one of those insurance carriers will go into liquidation, so uh, or into bankruptcy in simple terms. So that basically means that um, first of all, those insurance carriers that Black Oak has mostly in the portfolio as counterparties. They have very high capital, uh, they have capital requirements, regulatory ones. So that means one by one, they have to have assets for every li liability. But actually in their books, they have eight to nine times that. So they are very asset heavy. And even if they went into bankruptcy, which again would be very, very low um, you know, probability, but then what happens? So who will be entitled to have the first claim? So actually the first claim on their assets would be the tax department, the IRS, but then already um, insurance liabilities. So basically policyholders or investors into policies would be second rank after the tax department to receive uh, the proceeds from a liquidation. So it's kind of a superior um, debt in, in a way. Um, yes, so now um, just to briefly, I mentioned that, uh, for example, we have seen that, you know, the average annual returns for life settlements are between 8 to 12 percent on the market. But I mentioned that actually Black Oak uh, has more like a trajectory of 12 to 14 percent. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of you will wonder, OK, so why is Black Oak so different from the market? So now here we have to introduce SL Investment Management. It's simply the investment manager of Black Oak. So they have been around for the last 32 years, since 1990. And they were specialized in trading of UK endowments. And since uh, the early 2000s, moved to the US space simply because it's much more liquid, much more regulated, and so on and so forth. So what is the key uh, to success for them? First of all, they have one of the largest databases in that particular space. They have uh, analyzed close to 600,000 policies and purchased 70,000 policies out of these. However, for even those policies that they only looked at, they have tracked the outcome. So now they have a lot of data to make their estimates in terms of like, like the actuarial estimates even more substantial and profound. So when we look at SL as an investment manager, actually they're mostly targeting institut institutional investors. So 90% of their investors are actually large in institutions, but I'll get into that on the next slide. So they have managed roughly 8 billion US dollars since inception of, of policy face value, uh, but also they are a, a regulated entity in the UK. So SL is an investment manager as well as Black Oak is an FCA regulated manager, manager slash fund. But also what makes them unique is that they have certain, they have an in-house uh, propri proprietary um, valuation system. So I'm not going into details, but that basically means that their system can uh, automatically uh, come up with a first indicative quote, whereas the turnaround on the market is five, six uh, business days. So they can simply revert to those sellers much quicker in a very accurate manner to then proceed to the due diligence stage when they purchase those policies. So that also gives them a first mover advantage, and they mostly purchase the policies um, directly from those individuals, usually facilitated by agents. Whereas many players in the market, they go and buy policies from other institutions, which obviously adds, adds to the purchase price. So now this is like one of the last slides, um, because I believe, again, I wanted to give you like a brief, um, you know, short and crispy introduction and not like the very specifics. We can get into certain specifics in the q and I already see like a few questions popping up. So now when we see um, what are, I mentioned the key capabilities of the investment manager SL are institution, institutional investors. So basically they have in the last 30 years uh, managed over 30 different funds, so-called closed-ended funds for those large institutions, such as Credit Suisse, HSBC, Alliance, German Bank, Commerce Bank. So those institutions gave a few hundred million each to SL to manage basically into the life settlement um, space. So now uh, Black Oak is basically has the same 
institutional quality management, such as all those other vehicles. But the difference is that an investor can subscribe monthly and redeem quarterly subject to certain redemption terms. So it is much more accessible and much more liquid. Usually those large investors, they would commit for eight years, 10 years. It would be a closed vehicle. So they fund the vehicle. It will be invested. They get their payouts a few years down the line. So BlackRock is basically the same type of um, asset class as institutions invest in, the same uh, type of quality management by a very institutional player, but addressed to investors that do not say do not wish to invest uh, 20, 30 million US dollars to say, okay, we have I guess, a much smaller allocation there. Um, I believe also um, Rajiv has mentioned that this is like a new value proposition, and it is certainly a, a new value proposition in India. But what we also do see, apart from India, there's a lot of Asian capital actually coming into life settlements simply to the fact because markets are very volatile with the U.S. market or, you know, don't get me started on, on Hong Kong and China these days. So investors are actively seeking for, okay, how can I sustainably invest, still making decent um, double-digit returns, but not being exposed to the market and also limiting my downside. So this is why Black Oak has uh, attracted like a lot of um, capital. We have just reached 500 million US dollar of assets under management. And actually for India, for example, one of uh, the, the cornerstone investors from India that we have is Sundaram. Apologies for my uh, pronunciation. So they, this also shows that, you know, very large household invest, uh, investment houses, in India have done a very, you know, thorough, substantial due diligence. And they they also agreed, well, this is a good value proposition. And this is really something we would like to consider and, and you know, offer. So um, this is just, you know, a brief kind of uh, recap or a brief, you know, introduction of, you know, what is a life settlement? Um, what is Black Oak Fund? How has it performed? What are the investment attractions such as low correlation, double digit returns, low volatility, limited downside risk for that particular asset class? At the same time, you know, managed by a very large institutional player. So just to close the circle, of course, looking out at, at fixed income equities these days, like in US dollar terms, it is difficult to predict, have we hit a low or is it going lower? I mean, what we probably all can agree on that it will be very volatile in the coming months to come. So this is just, you know, a little bit of a baseline for you. And now um, I would like to open up for questions. So I will just go uh, by the Q&A one by one. Great. So um, I'm just going uh, by the... Let me just take maybe the oldest question, which is like, what business does Black Oak do? So Black Oak is uh, purely investing into life uh, settlements. So basically, they purchase life insurance policies at a discount and then receive the life, uh, the, the payment out of the life insurance company. And this is how the profits are generated. Um, Yes. So in terms of Carlisle, I think um, that is actually a very, very good question. So obviously looking, I cannot comment on Carlisle in particular because I do not have all the data and references and so on and so forth, but definitely how Black Oak differentiates themselves. So the key is to understand that life settlements have different managers. And there's managers that are maybe more successful and managers that are maybe less successful. So now um, one of the core um, you know, factors that an investor should always bear in mind when looking at more alternative asset classes is how is valuation done? Because valuation, you know, some people say it's more art than science. So this is like very important. So because there is a market, there's a very liquid market, there's a, a buying and selling of insurance policies of 30 billion US dollars every year between, you know, life settlement um, investors. So now the question is, if a fund has their policies in the portfolio, how 
Does the fund make sure that the valuation that they attach to the particular policy is in line with actually the market? And this is where, you know, this is uh, probably the most challenging part. So, of course, um, there is like two, three factors such. Uh, Black Oak and the investment manager, the investment manager have over 30 years of experience, one of the largest databases. They have one of the largest actuarial teams in the industry. So they certainly have the uh, expertise and capabilities. Then they review the policies on a quarterly basis. If there's any changes to the health data, that may trigger a revaluation of that particular policy. But most importantly, as far as I know, BlackRock is the only fund, um, open-ended fund in the life settlement space that has a third-party valuation audit. And when we talk about valuation audit, we talk about EY, Ernst Young, formerly known. They, on an annual basis, review the policies, review the portfolio, and they come up with an audit finding. So for the last two years, for example, EY and their actuaries had a look at the portfolio, and their key finding was, oh, yes, uh, according to our you know, um, uh, estimations or uh, calculations, we would have valued the portfolio 5 or 6% higher. That just gives an indication that basically the fund is very conservative in the valuation technique, but also there's other metrics to, for example, track, okay, how much are the estimations in line with the actual kind of performance of the fund. And basically, Black Oak has outperformed their own estimations, their own actuarial estimations, by, by usually between 120 and 140% in the last uh, eight years. So again, I cannot speak about Carlyle, but it is very important to have external validation of the valuation, to have certain metrics accessible that an investor can track on a monthly or quarterly basis to also estimate how the, perform, uh, the portfolio is, you know, in what direction it is uh, developing. Now, um, so I'm not quite sure about this highlight on which topic you are explaining. Um, yes, so the next question um, is, uh, the insurance companies are actually um, on average A plus ranked uh, counterparties. So uh, most of those insurance companies, you know, from a credit point of view are A plus. Some are a double plus or a triple A. I mean, there, there's different metrics, whether it's S&P or best AM. But basically, um, this is uh, one of the keys, you know, um, facts about the fund, the very highly um, investment grade rated insurance companies. So are the returns guaranteed? If yes, then what is the rate of return? If no, can you give a tentative range with past performance? That is a very good question. Uh, there is no um, guarantee on returns. However, the historical performance uh, has been 14.7% um, annualized net of management fee, fee for the past eight and a half years. So this is just a past performance. Uh, naturally forward looking, our estimation is between 12 to 14% annually, looking at the portfolio co composition, looking at uh, the policies, some of them have been purchased in 2017 and 18 and will, you know, come to, to maturity soon. So the estimation is, uh, you know, between 12 to 14 uh, percent on an uh, annual basis. Um, so context with regards to Indian investor perspective, I'm not quite sure. Maybe you could kind of um, elaborate in more detail. Yes, maybe Rajiv, maybe you can help me out here a little bit. That uh, from the Indian investor's perspective, uh, since, since we all are aware that it is, uh, uh, as far as India is concerned, we are very well poised. However, uh, these next two or three quarters will be extremely, extremely turbulent. So just to maintain the asset allocation, because as a group, as a years group, we firmly believe that all the asset classes are good. Whether it is equities, currencies, commodities, real estate, or even fixed income. It's just the matter of your asset allocation, right. what matters. So, so right. in the same context, it's one of the way it's, it's a quasi fixed income. You can say, which you can, uh, if, if your, if, if your asset allocation permits, you can definitely look at it as an option. Yes, correct. Yes. So I definitely agree. So of course, you know, Indian markets have been doing very well in the last uh, years. 
So um, I also agree. Like so, so definitely my my key message is not you know switch all your assets into life settlement. I would never recommend that because you know you never have all your eggs in one basket. But the idea is more like have a more prudent allocation. And usually talking to let's say private investors, they do not tend to have a life settlement exposure. So it's just like adding the exposure, hedging your portfolio, and also because fixed income on a let's say a lower risk base is not returning those returns that actually like a life settlement portfolio can add. So it's more about, I agree with you, asset allocation for some investors, it can be 5%, others can be 10, 15. You know, I, I cannot advise on that. That is like, you know, more like an individual discussion to, to be having. But definitely like also from, from an Indian perspective, there will be volatility and it is good just to add this particular asset class as more like a, a hedge to the portfolio, I, I would say. Um, yes. So now, what should be the age of the senior citizen you talk of paying premium? Um, yes. So basically, usually the average life expectancy is between five to six years. So those senior individuals, maybe let me open uh, one particular slide. Um, let me just go. Yeah. So basically, the average um, age of uh, the, the citizens is roughly 81 years. And when we look at the um, life expectancy, it is currently uh, 5.4 years. So that is basically just the average. Basically, this investment uh, in life settlement is through LRS, wherein an individual can transfer up to $250,000 on an annual basis. Now, all the proceedings in any of uh, the offshore funds, the tax is as per your debt asset class, which is in the short term, which is less than three years, it is taxed as per your income tax rates. And if it is more than three years, it is taxed at 20% with indexation. Uh, what are the risks? Do, you, uh, do we have the risk of regulatory change? So risk, uh, I mean, there, there's several risks. So one is, for example, credit counterparty risk. So that means uh, if uh, one of the insurance companies goes into liquidation and they're they're not paying out um, the the particular uh, policy, um, first of all, in the last thirty years of the existence of SL and eight and a half years of BlackRock, they have a one hundred percent collection record. But at the same time, just looking at how well capitalized those insurance carriers are, um, the probability that they will go into liquidation is probably low. But even so, there are certain mechanisms that protect um, policyholders um, and as such investors into those policies, such as certain states govern um, that, uh, you know, if one insurance carrier goes um, into bankruptcy, another has to take over the policy or there's certain, uh, you know, uh, funds that will pay out uh, the policy, so provision funds that will pay out the policy. So, so there's a different, um, like in terms from a regulatory risk, I would say um, it is actually very low simply because just looking at the US and the senior population, um, underfunded pensions, lower savings rates, and of course, uh, in the future, probably also inflation, you, you know, doing um, uh, the rest. That basically means that the state as well as the federal government, they're well aware that, you know, uh, seniors will have will need means to monetize some of their assets. And if they can monetize their insurance policies and immediately, you know, get like a cash payment from investor, this particular uh, particular senior citizen will no longer be basically on the payroll of the state for any medical support, for any type of, you know, uh, benefits or life, uh, you, you, you know, like just to kind of get by in, in their life. So I would say regulatory risk and credit risk on the lower side. And then, of course, you, you have legal risk, for example, that, you, you know, there's any kind of type of, um, you know, condition in the contract when, when the policy is being transferred that may uh, backfire. But at the same time, this is also like a very, you know, thorough process accompanied by U.S. legal counsel. It's a 120 due diligence list. To 20 point of due diligence list to transfer policy. At the same time, uh, the, the insurance company does the same assessment. And once uh, the ownership has been transferred, there's uh, usually no way back, and we have not come across those um, 
kind of cases. Now, what is the role of SL? Uh, why do they do what they do in this investment? So basically, SL they have um, they basically buy those policies. So they um, you know perform the due diligence on those policies. They uh, perform all the actuarial assumptions. So basically, just the skill that they have to to estimate, um, you, you know, how long they will have to pay premiums when this policy will more or less, you know, be maturing. This is basically crucial for actually having like a successful life settlement portfolio. Because of course, imagine um, you you purchase a policy, the life expectancy is six years, but that individual lives for 15 years. Then of course, the premium payments will reduce the returns for that particular policy. So of course, no one will 100% know when those policies will mature, but you can estimate it. And just simply looking at the track record of over you know, of having higher actual maturities than what they initially expected. That is just a very stark indicator that they are capable of sourcing policies. And, and those policies tend to create returns earlier than expected. Um, liquidity of this instrument, this is a very good question. So liquidity is uh, quarterly plus 90 days. So that basically means um, ideally like the investor redeems uh, end of every quarter and then will receive the payment within 90 days. Of course, if that um, deadline is missed, then it could be uh, five, six months uh, subject to, to when they redeem. So it's, it's definitely important from an investor point of view to have it at the back of the mind that there are like four trade days a year and they can exit. Because this is uh, certainly where the most difference is to, let's say, fixed income or, or traditional. Um, yes, so uh, return is not guaranteed. And also the principal amount, there's no guarantee. However, uh, just looking at, um, you know, the past performance and um, the, the current kind of estimation is that, I mean, it is uh, the risk is minimized as much as possible for for uh, because the last drawdown that the, the fund has actually had was in December 2016, and now the portfolio has roughly six to seven hundred policies. So there is like a very large diversification. There's a, a lot of policies, and um, so basically, again, I I will not say that this, uh, the return is guaranteed or the capital is guaranteed. But from a risk return perspective, it is a very attractive because it's an A plus credit counterparty risk um, at, uh, and like let's say double digit returns. Um, uh, I think that's related for the worst case scenario. So yeah, the worst case scenario, I mean, in, uh, I'm just not sure in what context whether it's worst case when insurance policy uh, carriers will go into liquidation or if it's like the returns of, uh, of Black Oak. So maybe um, let me talk about the returns of Black Oak. So of course, let's say the worst case scenario is you have um, like a policy and the policy uh, is supposed to be maturing in six years, but instead that particular individual lives for 12 or 15 years, for example. So first of all, um, there is, uh, a, a, basically, there is a metric that is being tracked on a monthly basis on a, um, uh, you know, on the portfolio. And it is, uh, it can, I'll give you an example on a policy level. So this is called the period to loss. So that basically means at what, what point in time would a policy become uh, losing money, basically. So now the period to loss is currently at 240% for the whole portfolio. But just to give you an example on one particular policy, it's just easier to grasp the concept. So you have an 80-year-old senior. That 80-year-old senior has a six-year life expectancy. So now um, if the senior lives uh, seven years, of course the return will drop because for one more year the fund has to pay a premium. But basically when we talk about the, those 240%, that would mean that this particular senior of 80 years will have to live close to 15 years or yeah or even yeah 13 14 years instead of 12 years so just applying it by 2.4 so 240 percent um, higher 
And now we're looking at 80-year-old individuals with usually at least one or two health impairments. So that particular individual with a 60-year, like 80-year-old with a six-year life expectancy would have to outlive, let's say, by 15 years, just to make it easy in terms of calculation. So they would have to live instead of till 86 to 95. So again, like from a probabilistic uh, perspective and calculations and also, you know, science and nature, this is very low probability. So baseline is that on a portfolio, unless all policies in the whole portfolio uh, suddenly will outlive the life expectancy by 2.4, 2 then uh, the portfolio will drop to zero. But if these type of uh, policy holders would outlive even longer, then this is when the fund would start losing uh, capital. But again, this is like very, you, you know, um, you know, low probability. Um, so now the question is, this is probably better for Rajiv, like with a debt or equity. So it's, n well, it's neither debt nor equity. And of course, tax implications. I'm not sure if you want to uh, point it out again or. Yeah, uh, sort of, I think yeah. we've already discussed about the tax implications, yeah, exactly. but it is debt tax implications, which is be, which is applicable to these kind of funds. Yes. So in terms of what is the time horizon for this investment, um, the recommendation is, I would say, four to five years. So basically, the reason is because also live settlements, um, so it's not a short term investment. It's not uh, like also you see with the liquidity, we do not want to have investors who come in and after six months uh, change of heart. I mean, yes, there's always exceptional circumstances, but the idea is more uh, in order to get the full kind of return cycle. So those that we uh, mentioned 12 to 14 percent on an annual basis, you need to be in, all, in the whole investment cycle. And that investment cycle is uh, more four to five years. Because simply the policy is purchased, it takes a few years to be uh, maturing and then to receive the insurance money. So when you cover like four or five years of your investment, then you will have the whole kind of life cycle of this particular asset class. And it's this type of investment that you don't have to track on a daily basis. You check in every month what were the returns or what was the performance. And it's kind of like the, you know, sort of... Um, you know, bond equivalent in your portfolio. Expense ratio. So expense ratio, uh, first of all, like from, from an investor perspective, um, the management fee is 1.5%. Performance fee is 20% above 8% hurdle. So anything that is above 8% annually will be subject to a 20% performance fee. But this will be only taken upon redemption. So the investor does not pay any performance unless they basically have the calculation and they will receive their payout. And let's say in five years, the fund makes 40%, which is five times 8%. There's no performance fee. If above that, there is performance fee of 20%. Now expense ratio, probably if you had to ask me for a number, I would say is roughly uh, 50 bips. But again, like it works slightly different in a life, life settlement portfolio. In terms of, um, for the time being, this is our last question. So thank you, everyone who's, who's still bearing with, with us. How is the NAV calculated? It is simply um, the uh, valuation of the policies. So 50% or like a part of um, the, the portfolio is policies and the valuation. And of course, month on month, this valuation grows. So it's quite similar to the closer bond gets to a maturity, the more value it'll hold. And the other part is realized return. So simply the policies that are uh, maturing. So now um, an investor purchases in a unit price. And, um, you know, that on a monthly basis, they will get an update on their unit price. But yeah, the NAV is partially modeled return and partially realized return on, on the policy value and policy payment from the insurance company. So, yes, so that's, I think, uh, mostly, has mostly covered all the questions. Yeah, I think, uh, Patricia, we have covered the questions and thank you so much. I like, uh, it's quite, uh, it's, it's easy to understand. And I really thank you. all my clients, my esteemed customers, for bearing with us, as Patricia mentioned, uh, only one humble request that uh, yes. to uh, all my clients that if you still have any queries, 
because the quality of times if you still have any queries please reach out to our uh, relationship managers and they in turn will get us connected to the black oak team if needed yes so, i think there's one more question uh, which is probably the the minimum um, investment so like on a fund level it's usd 100000 um so i'm not sure if it's the same at yes bank or whether you you you're pooling as so you, yeah that's basically yeah. so the minimum mean. investment as you mentioned is 100000 which in indian terms is close to 81 odd lakh rupees so uh, that that's the minimum investment for you and uh, i can look at uh, mr pankaj tandon queries that yes sir we will be sharing the copy of the presentation and the faqs and if needed you can connect with the rms we'll be more than happy to take this one on one also with you yes exactly and again today's call was more more about giving a general impression and uh, education on life settlements so i was really just covering the baseline so i'm i'm pretty sure you will have more questions and you can just reach out to your relationship managers and of course uh, maybe if there is like several similar requests we could have maybe another call and address it or the rms will will deal with it so thank you very yeah. much for having me right thank thanks here. patricia so just to thank quickly quickly uh, summarize what patricia mentioned that it's a, it's a new asset class as far as domestic market is concerned agnostic to markets because here the underlying asset remains the insurance policy of predominantly us clients just like in mutual funds in india we have the underlying asset which is equity or debt here the underlying asset is insurance policies now where the meat is basically the 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 fund management team uh, uh, it's it's like a reverse mortgage philosophy which prevails in india so it's it's a win win situation for the client who is currently 80 81 years looking for some money for whatever time he or she is there it's a win win situation for our clients because they are earning returns agnostic to markets it's a win win situation for the even the government at us what i understood is because they have to spend less on the well being of the senior citizens so overall uh, 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 it's very very simple but very effective uh, way of investing and as we mentioned that the minimum investment is 100000 dollars in uh, in this and still if you have any queries or any uh, any thing you want to know please reach out to our relationship managers uh, we have i think one more question by the time uh, um uh yes i think it's a deck yes. to be shared so yes mr rastogi we will be sharing the presentation deck with you uh 100% with with uh i i'm sure you can get in touch with your relationship manager or if you need anything uh, you can write to to us directly i'll i'll share my mail id uh, to you uh, it is rajiv that is r a j w e v and dot mathur which is m a t h u r at y s i l dot in i'll again repeat it's rajiv that is r a j w e v dot mathur m a t h u r at y s i l dot in we'll be happy to share the entire presentation deck with you so with this we culminate the the session and uh, happy to to host all of you so thank, thank you, you for, for there being there with us thank you so much